In Yassi, Romania, in eight days from the 28th of June to the 6th of July, 1941, nearly 15,000 Jews were murdered during a pogrom. The orders came from above and were enthusiastically applied by the police, the army and the local population. At the time, the systematic extermination of Europe's Jews had not yet become policy. In Yassi, there were neither gas chambers nor crematorium ovens, but all the other elements were there. The terror, the humiliation, the sealed wagons, famine, public executions, hatred. All that remains of the Yassi pogrom are a handful of survivors and around a hundred photographs. Most were taken by German soldiers who sent them to their families by way of souvenirs. The pictures show such a degree of savagery that taking photos of exactions was subsequently banned in the German army for the rest of the war. In summer 1940, Romania was divided up. Hitler and Stalin, then allies, forced the country to cede one third of its territory to Hungary, Bulgaria and the USSR. Anger festered in what remained of the country. On the 6th of September, General Ion Antonescu came to power, deeply anti-Semitic. The new regime soon aligned itself with Nazi Germany. This spelt disaster for the Jews. At the Council of Ministers on the 27th of September, Antonescu declared, we will kick out the Jews everywhere. We will drive them out without leaving them the means to exist. We will throw them out of schools and out of professions so they cannot earn a living. In January of 1941, demonstrations followed by riots against the Jews took place in Bucharest, where a pogrom left 120 victims. The mood was terrible. Jews were driven out, beaten, humiliated. My father was an accountant in a big clothing factory. His boss owned lots of property. He was abducted and was found hanging on a hook in an abattoir with a sign round his neck that said, kosher meat. Romanians did that. Six months later, on the 22nd of June 1941, the Germans launched Operation Barbarossa and advanced into Soviet territory. Hoping to recover the land it had lost, Romania entered the war on the side of Germany. On the 24th and 26th of June, Russian aviation pounded the city of Iasi, the air raids exacerbating the prevailing anti-Semitism. State media claimed that Soviet parachutists had been dropped in the Iasi region, where they were met by Jews who took them into hiding. What we found most terrifying was this incredible hysteria against the Jews. The war had only just begun, and we were already being accused of spying for the Soviets and of giving them signals with devices or lanterns, which was just a malicious lie. Signals? What kind of signals? Only an idiot or a madman could imagine that from the attic of a house you can signal to Soviet aircraft. You have to remember that Yassi was the cradle of the extreme right and anti-Semitism in Romania. Jews were beaten and spat upon. Their windows were smashed. The synagogue of Pakurari was attacked and vandalized. The authorities accused the Jewish community of attacking Romanian soldiers in the street. The army searched houses looking for evidence. Posters on the walls proclaimed, Romanian brothers, the time for vengeance against the Jews has come. 
One Sunday, I was going to the market with my father on a fine day, so my mother could get some rest. And I remember my father stopping in front of a poster and saying to me, Ah, my girl, there are very tough times ahead. Jewish men were requisitioned and ordered to dig large trenches, 30 meters long by 15 wide, in Yassi's Jewish cemetery. The police advised the Christian population to identify themselves by a crucifix placed in the window or with a cross drawn on their front door. People realized that a pogrom was being planned. Everyone kept their heads down. Jews no longer went out. Who would have been brave enough to go into the street? The writer Corsio Malaparte, war correspondent for the Corriere della Sera, later wrote, In Yassi, people were worried. In the half-light, I glimpsed three bearded figures dressed in black. A terrible danger loomed over us. The Romanian authorities were preparing a pogrom. The massacre could start at any moment. Heaven help us. I can't do anything. I'm a foreigner, an Italian. Who would listen to me? On the 27th of June, 1941, Antonescu ordered the commander of the Iasi garrison to purge the city of its Jewish population. The operation was given the code name, the Grand Plan. On Friday morning, there were rumors that some Jews had been killed in the city's outskirts. I remember my father telling us, no way, that can't be true. That sort of thing doesn't happen in Romania. On Saturday morning, just before the pogrom began, we were woken at six o'clock by someone knocking softly on the door. We were scared to death. No one dared open the door. Then the knocking grew louder and I heard the voice of one of my aunts, my mother's sister. Open up, it's me, Rebecca. She was usually so elegant. But now she was wearing a nightshirt and dressing gown. What were we going to do? Where should we go? We asked her what was going on. Mrs. What's-Her-Name was shot dead with her child in her arms. It was clear that the massacre of the Jews had begun. The manhunt was mainly carried out by the police, the gendarmerie and the army but they were joined by a large section of the civilian population, lowly officials, employees and craftsmen, simple neighbors, combat veterans and retirees who turned into persecutors. The German soldiers stationed in Iasi also participated. To hide, they had all the lights turned off. All the apartment windows, and even the tramways, had their lights on. They moved around like ghost trains. And in the middle of the night, some trucks arrived with hundreds or perhaps thousands of civilians. Some had even taken their own cars. They started to shoot from the church tower. They shouted horrible slogans against the Jews. Down with Jews. Death to the Jews. Those filthy Jews are traitors. They want to destroy us. The Jews are the allies of the Bolsheviks. All kinds of atrocities were committed in homes. People were beaten, tortured, pillaged. They were robbed of everything they possessed. In three days, they massacred one-third of the Jewish population of Yassi. People were killed in the street, sometimes in front of their own homes. Corsio 
Corsio Malaparte wrote in his novel Caput, Everywhere, the gleeful and ferocious work of the pogrom filled the streets and the squares with bursts of weeping, terrible shrieks, and cruel laughter. Gendarmes broke down front doors with their rifle butts. Disheveled women chose to throw themselves out of windows. Groups of soldiers tossed grenades through windows of basements, where many families tried to hide. Jews fled down the streets, pursued by soldiers and fanatical civilians armed with knives and iron bars. The streets were strewn with human forms, and the sidewalks covered with bodies piled on top of each other. My father had lots of Christian friends. They came to help us and hide us, but it was too late. They came around 8 o'clock on Sunday morning. We were awoken by banging on the door and shouts. All Jews out of the house. We were terrified. We didn't know what was going on. I remember the sound of the German officer's boots on the stairs. Hearing them come up the steps, we were all petrified. They came in and shouted, all Jews out. And in German, raus. There were police and gendarmes armed and wearing helmets and two German officers. They politely asked us to leave. They started to shout, are all the Jews here? Who is Jewish? They hadn't yet checked the back part of the courtyard. And just then, our neighbors, a couple who were usually so kind, said to them, come around here, there are still some old Jews inside. The soldiers went in and brought out my grandparents. My mother, my brother and I went out into the courtyard. Then someone rounded us up before making us join some other Jews arrested further up the street. No one told us why we'd been arrested or what we were accused of. They separated us. The women and children on one side, the men and teenage boys on the other. My mother didn't understand what was going on. I was seven and a half. She took me in her arms, and I wasn't taken away with the men. A German officer said, no. The woman and the girl stay, and that's how my mother and my sisters were spared, and they stayed in the house. Only my father and I were taken away. They didn't take the women, only those who didn't want to leave their husband or their father or grandfather. The orders were just the men, so there were few women. My mother, who wanted to try and save my brother and me, went over to a German officer. But I shouted, We won't leave Papa. We'll face the same fate as him. Like everyone, I was terrified. And my mother was weeping. We never saw my father again from the moment he joined the group of men. And then they took us away with our hands in the air, as if we were criminals or bandits. On Sunday, the 29th of June, the Jews of Iasi were rounded up, then escorted to police headquarters. They were mainly men, but also women, children and old people. Those who couldn't walk were shot. The streets were gradually littered with bodies, which they didn't even bother to remove. The streets were empty, apart from the bodies strewn all over the place. We could see it all even with our hands in the air. They were the bodies of those killed one or two days before. 
Some people were still in pyjamas. They'd been taken from their beds without being given time to get dressed. At the time, I was just a child. I was 14 years old, and I said to my father, Daddy, we're never coming back home. I had a premonition. We marched on and on. And looking up, I saw Germans in the windows. They were taking photographs of us. There were concealed machine guns and soldiers all over the place. People spat on us from the windows, shouting all sorts of anti-Semitic insults. At the end of the morning, once they'd reached the courtyard of the prefecture, officials gave each rounded-up Jew a ticket, a sort of pass, which they were told would now have to be shown at each check. They handed out a ticket with the stamp on it which said free. And they were told to tell other Jews that if they didn't present themselves at the prefecture with their identity cards to collect their ticket, they would be shot. Thinking this was a simple formality, hundreds of people hurried to obtain this important document. In fact, it was a trap set for any Jews who had so far avoided the roundups. And that's how they assembled thousands of Jews, all those who hadn't been arrested before. Some 200 people, mainly women with a stamped ticket, managed to leave the premises. But at 1 p.m., the operation was suspended. No more Jews were allowed to leave. There was a deathly silence. We went into a sort of corridor filled with people. And just then, the shouts and blows intensified. Filthy Jews, communist Jews. We were met by police officers and gendarmes with horsewhips, who struck the people on the back of the neck. The blows were so ferocious that blood ran on the ground. They ordered us to lay on the ground and to stay like that, without moving. And that was when the pogrom began. They gathered all the people in the courtyard and they started shooting. The people dropped like flies. I was only nine at the time, but those images are engraved forever in my memory. The gendarmes and the Germans carried out a slaughter, a massacre. The injured were moaning. Someone cried, we're all going to die. They carried on shooting with all the weapons they had. People were running in every direction. But there was nowhere to go. The fiercest fire came from the prefecture gate, which was the way out. It was hell. I could hear the shots as those who tried to scale the fence were gunned down. My father shouted to me, run! So I ran, without thinking what was going on. But where do you go? I found myself in the middle of a group of people who were being shot at with rifles, and they were falling, one after another. I never saw my brother again. He was probably killed at the prefecture. My grandmother's family lived opposite our house. Her husband, 
her children, two boys, and her son-in-law. The whole family was shut inside the prefecture. None of them came back. They were all killed. That was how, in a very short space of time, there were hundreds of dead. It was a terrible sight. We stayed with our faces to the ground, and we waited. The following morning, they made a convoy of those who had survived, the handful who were still alive. And we walked to Yassi's central station. On Monday, the 30th of June, the authorities took those Jews who survived the massacre to the station, firing on any who didn't walk fast enough. A communique stated, on the night of the 28th to the 29th of June, 1941, a Judeo-communist rebellion took place, firing on the army and the civil authorities with guns. Those responsible, 500 Jewish communists were executed on the spot. Order was restored. Meanwhile, throughout the city, the authorities continued to make arrests, and the slaughter continued. In the courtyard of the prefecture, the survivors were forced to clean the blood off the cobblestones. The victims were thrown into a mass grave in the Jewish cemetery that was dug a few days earlier. When we arrived at the station, they made us lie on the ground. It was the spot where the horses stopped. The ground was covered in their excrement and urine, and we were lying in it. The passengers getting off the trains had to pass that spot. There was no other exit. And I well remember that grotesque, unimaginable scene. Us lying on the ground, and people who wanted to leave, but didn't dare walk past. And at that moment, we heard a voice cry, Walk over them! You can walk over them! They're only Jews! And the people walked right over us, trampling our heads and chests. A German officer arrived and asked one of the Romanian officials which side he could pass. And the Romanian told him, no problem, you can walk on them. The Romanian gendarmes were far more inhuman and brutal than the Germans. We were paraded in front of them and they took everything we owned. Pens, watches, gold rings. They said to us, give me that. You'll have no need for it where you're going. There is a train used for cattle transport awaiting us. They made us climb into the wagons, which were empty. There were nearly 120 people packed into our wagon, when it could only contain 30 or 40 people maximum. We were squashed up against each other. They shut the door and left us there. In front of each wagon, there was a soldier with a horsewhip or a stick, and he counted us. There was our entire family, 18 or 20 people. We were all in the same wagon. We couldn't breathe. In our wagon, there was a layer of manure on the floor. And there was a kind of lime sprinkled on it, which was giving off great heat. It was unbearable. We were suffocating. A railway man came along with some wooden planks and long nails. He nailed the openings shut in such a way that there was less than one centimeter between the planks. The railway workers called us all Bolsheviks. They said we didn't deserve to live and that we were enemies of the Romanians. Everything had been prepared to kill us. It was obvious that with the layer of manure and the shutters closed, 
It was impossible to breathe. It was summer, July. They didn't give us a drop of water. We started to cry out because we were suffocating. We were dying of thirst. But no one answered. The word went around that one of the Romanian guards, the one responsible for watching over us, would bring us water in exchange for money. People gave him all they had. Of course, he never brought the water. It was a lie. I don't know how long we stayed there. One or two hours. Then the train began to move. Several thousand Jews were packed into two trains. In one of them, there were almost 2,000 people, men, women, children and old people. The last of the 18 wagons contained 80 bodies of those executed at the station. In the other, some 2,600 men and teenage boys were crammed into 20 wagons. The two convoys had orders to go around in circles for hours as slowly as possible. The aim was to kill all the occupants by asphyxiating them in the hermetically sealed wagons. There were all kinds of people in the wagons. Women, children, elderly people, young ones. Some started to cry out, water, or let me out and they began to get agitated. We were the only children in the wagon. Me, my brother, and a neighbor's daughter who lived with us. The only children. Inside the wagon, in those conditions, without air or water, People started to die. We found the first body an hour later. Some moistened their shirts with their own urine for those who could still urinate. And then they moistened their lips with their shirt. People started to undress. My mother ended up in her underwear. She was desperately looking for a little air somewhere so she could breathe. She tried to move towards the small opening, but she couldn't make any progress. At one point, she slipped and fell to the wagon floor. She remained sitting there among these people she thought were asleep. But my brother saw that they were in fact the bodies of those who had died and which were falling on her, and she started to cry for help. We were living in our own sweat, our own stench, our own excrement, our own urine. Death was traveling with us in that wagon. Some fell to the floor, cut down by fatigue, thirst, hunger, and they never got up again. And then a place became free. As it went on, our numbers diminished. We piled up the bodies the way you stack wood. I was sitting on bodies the way I'm sitting on this chair. I remember it all. As I talk to you now, I can see the train again, and I can see my mother lying on the floor. I remember it all. I can still see it all. I saw some surreal scenes in our wagon. Things you couldn't make up. For example, there was a tailor, whose name I've forgotten. He said to his son, Aren't you ashamed? You could at least have worn a tie. 
But his son could neither hear him nor reply because he was dead. His father had gone mad. That train was a ghost train, travelling on abandoned tracks with no timetable. It stopped in stations that had no name. It was as if this train did not exist. They sent us around and around on that railroad. Everything had been arranged so that those who were put on board would not come out alive. Podou Iloaye is a town a few kilometers from Yasi. We should have been there in half an hour. And we got there after perhaps 10 hours in infernal heat, more than 30 degrees because of the metal roofs. And we were packed inside. It was hell. Hell was in there with us, and death too. Malaparte wrote in Caput, in Podu Iloaye, after a while we saw the train. The soldiers climbed into the wagon and started throwing out the bodies one after the other. Dead bodies came out of the wagon and landed in groups with a thud with all their weight like cement statues. Some of the inhabitants of the village and local farmers lent a hand to toss out the dead and line them up along the bank of the railroad. Having died from asphyxiation, their heads were all swollen. There were around a thousand lined up, a thousand bodies laid out in the blazing sun. It's a lot. It was too much. They found a baby that was still alive, gripped between its mother's knees. It had fainted, but was still breathing. One of its little arms was broken. Its mother had been crushed to death in the fierce struggle. When we arrived at Bordeaux Il Loyer, most of these survivors had gone mad. The members of the same family no longer recognized one another. The father did not recognize his son. They had changed so much, dehydrated, broken by hours of anguish. A few days beforehand, the leaders of the Jewish community in Podu Il Loyer had been summoned. They gathered them in the main square and told them that some Jews were arriving from Yasi and that they had to feed and house them. Otherwise, they would suffer the same fate. We had to go to various places to do all sorts of work. We were naked, totally covered in mud and this filthy water. We worked along the railroad or on farms. All of us, even the children. As we were walking along, the villagers, those who believed in God, hit us. Telling us that it was we who had killed Jesus and that we deserved all this. I noticed several carts driven by Romas. They were bringing out the bodies and piling them up. I was terrified by those piles of bodies, two or three meters high. Others were digging mass graves. It was a terrible stench. While they piled the bodies in the mass graves at Podu Iloaye, the second train continued on its way to Kalarasi, some 500 kilometers from Yasi. The orders were clear. The journey must last several days. We realized that our train was not traveling in the same direction, but that it was going backwards and forwards. 
We soon realized that there was no set destination. People were relieving themselves in the wagon. There were some harrowing scenes. People didn't know what they were doing anymore. In that train, my cousin tried to hang himself with his belt, but his father managed to take it from around his neck. After two days, people started to die. The train would stop in little stations. Someone opened the door and tossed the bodies out, like sacks. Sometimes the train stopped in a station at night. The rain had formed puddles of water and mud alongside the train. In other wagons, people tore off the wooden planks and dashed over to drink that filthy water. Obviously, they all died on the spot. The water was infected. My father no longer knew what he was saying. He was delirious. He was 51. I was 16. I just couldn't manage to calm him down. He was really suffering. Especially from thirst. On the third day, I fell asleep. And when I woke up, my father was dead. They opened the wagon door and threw him out, like a sack, too. Between Yassi and Roman, there were many stations, and the train would stop to clear out the bodies. They used the local farm workers to bury the dead. They undressed the bodies. By way of payment, they were allowed to keep anything they found on the bodies. My mother's brother was on that train. They shot people and buried them while they were still alive. A priest Paul Teodorescu later recalled, we could hear cries coming from the mass grave. A German officer ended up giving permission to exhume the person buried alive. It was no easy job, because the survivor had been buried since the morning and was at the bottom of the trench, covered by the others. We managed to pull him out. He was naked, covered in mud and filth. He refused to drink, but just plunged his wrists into a bucket of cold water. We put some clothes on him and put him in the truck that had arrived from the station, bringing another lot of bodies. The train continued on its way. It was already the third day. The train stopped in the station at Roman. On the 3rd of July, Viorica Akarici, president of the local Red Cross, was present at Roman. She had come to greet soldiers returning from the front but heard moaning coming from a train at a halt on the tracks. Using the prerogatives of her function, she obtained authorization to distribute food to the passengers and have them transferred to another train while the bodies were removed. This complex we were stripped naked. They gave us water and a little bread. 
Not much. And some old clothes. Viorica Agarici's intervention was condemned by the authorities. Facing the death penalty, she was forced to resign and leave town. We were ordered to board another train. I asked, why? Where are you taking us? But no one answered. From the moment they put us on that train until our arrival four or five days later, I didn't see a single German, just Romanians. On the 6th of July 1941, the survivors on the second train reached their final destination, Kalarasi. Around a hundred of them died of exhaustion in the days that followed. That same day, the head of the Yassi Gendarmerie stated in the report he sent to the authorities, On the 30th of June 1941, I sent two convoys of Jews from Yassi, one train of 2,500 and another of 1,900. In the first, 1,194 Jews died during the journey. The train stopped at Podu Ilawai, where the bodies were buried and the survivors taken in by local Jews. In the second, two groups of 650 and 327 Jews died. The bodies were buried in the area. I was only 16, but they put me in the group that was going to work. They said they were short of manpower. In November 1941, for no other reason than a bureaucratic mix-up, the authorities freed the Jews in the Kalarasi labor camp and in Podu Ilawai. On November 24th, we had an amazing surprise. They said to us, you're going back to Yassi. After four or five months, they received orders to allow us to return home. They took us straight to the station. They put us in another cattle wagon, and they told us, you're free, you can go home. And they took us back to Yassi. We heard that all those who had been deported were going to return home. I was walking alone, and I wondered what it would be like being reunited with my family. When I got back, there was my father and my sisters all petrified. They thought they were seeing a ghost. The joy of being back together again was indescribable. The city seemed foreign to me, hostile. I hated it. I felt that behind my back, people were shouting at me, Jews, you're all scum. All our old friends said to us, you must have suffered so much. But in truth, you could see they didn't give a damn. Others murmured, a shame they left some of them alive. In our family, 14 people died of suffocation in the wagons. Everyone was talking about it in Yassi. They all died. From our grandfather to all his grandchildren, twins, a boy and a girl aged 21, all of them. No one came back. What could I do? I no longer had a father, mother or brother. I was alone in the world. When I got back home, my mother had no idea about what had happened to us. No one knew where we'd been. No one had told her anything. She opened the door and said to me, we've got nothing to give you. She thought I was a beggar who'd come to ask for charity. She said, we've hardly got enough to feed ourselves. I said, but mom, don't you recognize me? She looked at me long and hard, then she fainted. 
Later on, she asked me where my father was. I told her he was dead. She asked where he was buried. I replied, I don't know, somewhere near Roman. Even today, I don't know where my father is buried. I don't know what happened to my father. Perhaps he was shot in the street, or at the station during the massacre, or maybe he died in the wagons. I have no idea. And sadly, I'll never know, neither where he died, nor where he's buried. My father was in the same wagon as my uncle, my mother's brother. He was the one who told me what happened. My father had been wounded at the prefecture and could no longer walk. They carried him as far as the wagon. My uncle told me, your father was near the little windows. He had some air. But my father told him he no longer wanted to live because he didn't know what had happened to the rest of his family who'd stayed in Yasi. He didn't know where I was and didn't know what had become of those who'd stayed in the house. He let himself slip away. They threw his body out in the Roman area, along with dozens of other bodies. He's somewhere there, buried in a mass grave. I went there and searched a long time, but I could find no trace of him. One day, we had to bury the victims of the wagons. The family members who were still alive had to identify the remains. My father went along. It was hard to recognize the men. He identified his sister thanks to a little scrap of dress, since the bodies themselves were unrecognizable due to the heat. The leader of the Jewish community brought together all the bones. They dug several common graves and they buried all that remained of the bodies together. There were no names inscribed anywhere. It was a deserted field, but that's where all the members of my family are buried. I went from one spot to another, saying the names of my aunt, my cousins, my grandfather, and each time I laid a stone with their name on it, as if I had found the exact place where they had been buried. The Jewish community in Yassi was forbidden from drawing up lists mentioning the number of victims. But by adding up those who were killed in the first massacres in the city's outskirts, the pogrom at the prefecture and the two trains, the number of Jews killed is estimated at 14,850, a figure confirmed by the Interior Ministry. Between 1941 and 1944, some 270,000 Romanian Jews were murdered or died from ill treatment during the Holocaust. Deported on interminable death marches to Ukraine, tens of thousands of them died of cold, hunger, or the ravages of typhus. The extermination of Romania's Jews did not stop until the night of the 23rd of August 1944, when Antonescu was overthrown. Handed over to the USSR on Stalin's request, he was taken back to Romania after a year of detention and tried for war crimes. Antonescu had falsified documents to mask his contribution in the planning of the pogrom and its execution, minimizing the number of victims and pushing responsibility for the atrocities onto the Germans. The two death trains in which thousands of Jews perished in those few days in cattle wagons without air or water were presented as an attempt by the Romanian authorities to save them. Found guilty of the deportation and execution of nearly 400,000 Romanian Jews, 
Ion Antonescu was sentenced to the firing squad at Jilava Prison near Bucharest. Before they fired, he raised his hat and cried, Viva Romania! In 1948, a tribunal tried those responsible for the pogrom in Yassi. Eight high-ranking officers, several gendarmes and soldiers, the region's prefect, the mayor of Yassi and several civilians were convicted and sentenced to forced labor. Some of those accused were acquitted due to lack of evidence. For more than 60 years, successive communist governments did all they could so the Yassi pogrom would be quietly forgotten. They wanted to perpetuate the myth of the entire population's resistance against the fascist tyranny and to minimize their role in the pogrom. However, an official inquiry showed that the massacre had been planned and carried out by the Romanians, down to its smallest detail and without any demand from the Germans. It was not until November 2004 that the Romanian state admitted its direct responsibility in the pogrom and made an official apology to the Jewish community. A plaque was placed at the entrance to Yassi Station in June 2011, 70 years later. <laughs>